say some things to you in as simple a way as possible at the beginning of this that I hope will be a resource for you later as you think it becomes complex. I'd like you to look back and think back at these original concepts on which we're trying to base this. And the subject is um, bonds payable. And what I'd like to do is have you think with me that we are a small company that dreams of, aspires of becoming a big company. How could we do that? In as simple a way as possible, tell me what it would take for us to grow to be a big company. Chris? Money. Money. I was thinking of the answer, money. I can think of two ways we could come up with the money. We could get it from owners. Hasn't that been our main theme this semester? Mm -hmm. Haven't we had partners invest in the business and we accounted for it? And hadn't, didn't we spend two chapters talking about corporations and having owners invest in the business and get money to undergird the company, to found it, to operate it successfully? I see some people nodding your heads and I appreciate that. We've been down that path. But from this picture, can you think of another way that we could get the money? Chris? Investors? Well, no, the owners are investors. investors. They bought stock. They invested in our business. I was thinking of another alternative. Uh, borrowing. Chris? Borrowing money. We could borrow money. And I was hoping you'd see that in the illustration on the screen. There are two sources of equity here. We've talked about owner's equity, we've talked about stockholder's equity, but what about creditor's equity? We could go out and borrow money and make some promises that we would pay interest and pay it back. They're not the long-term equity that owners are, <coughs> shareholder's equity, but we could nonetheless depend upon financing our company that way. Now. I may as well get to it. There are lots of names for this kind of borrowing. As individuals, when we go and buy a car and finance it, we call that notes payable. It's that picture on the screen. Increase assets, increase liabilities. If we buy a house, we call it mortgage note payable. This is not new to us. What's new to us is how big this is going to be, we're going to borrow a lot of money. And the name, bonds payable. That's what the chapter's about. This process, <coughs> well, if we went back one step, this process of taking an owner's money and giving the owner a share of stock compared with taking a creditor's money and giving the creditor a bond. We call this bonds payable. They look a lot the same. If you were to hold two of them in your hand, they would look similar. Bonds payable and common stock. But they are distinctly different in how they affect the accounting equation and how they affect us business-wise and how we must account for them. So with that introduction, that oversimplified introduction about where we're going, Let's talk about bonds payable and the things that we'd like to accomplish in this chapter about long-term liabilities. There are more mentioned in the chapter than we're going to cover. We're primarily focusing on the bonds payable portion of this. At the beginning, at the end, when you begin to study and to look back over the things that you're responsible for, look back at this list again. The things that we'd like to do today and this week and test you on are we'd like for you to know how to determine and record the selling price of a bond. I'd like for you to know how to record amortization. It's a funny word. It's a concept that we've seen someplace else called something different. We can relate to that, that we should already know. Amortization of a premium or a discount. 
And there are two ways to, uh, to do that. Straight line method and interest method, uh, called effective interest method in the book, I think. And one of them is superior to the other. I'd like for you to know which is better and to get good at both of them, but particularly the one that's preferred. The part I'm not going to get to today for sure is recording a redemption of a bond. It's in your homework. We'll deal with it in class later in the week. It's paying off the bond. Sometimes we pay off the bond early. Sometimes we pay it off at maturity. We want to kind of do these things in order. These are the things that I'd like to do with you, as many as we can today, to try to accomplish that. Long-term liabilities are borrowing money from the public. The deal here is the examples I've used before this moment have been borrowing a car, borrowing money to buy a car, that's from one financial institution. The credit union or the bank or some sort of finance company is going to loan you that money. Or your house, the bank or a savings and loan or somebody like that is going to loan you the money. What we're attempting to do here is borrow so much money that there is not one lending institution that is willing to give you the whole amount. We want to borrow a lot of money. And instead of relying on one financial institution to provide us with that loan, we're going into the public marketplace. We're looking for, Chris used the term, investors, who instead of buying stock, are willing to buy bonds from us. They give us cash, we give them this sheet of paper, and in doing so, we promise two things. I said it before and I'll say it again. It amazes me when you go astray, when you start wondering what to do later this week, when it gets complex, how the answer to the complexity is right at this very beginning, foundation. If you will loan me money, I make two promises. I promise I will pay you back. That's true of car loans and house loans and credit cards and all the other debt that you know about. It's no different. Except to say, I promise I will pay you back face. So we're even saying how much. Leah, I want you to tell the class what this is. A dollar bill. It looks to me like it's a ten dollar bill. It's a one dollar bill. It's a hundred dollar bill. Nope. How do you know? It has a one on it. Well, how do you know what multiple this bond is? We're going to print it right on it. It's, a, it's going to be a $1,000 bond or a $10,000 bond or a $500 bond. We're going to be able to see that amount. <coughs> that amount is described as its face. Sometimes we describe that as a percentage. Sometimes we say 100%, meaning 100% of face. Sometimes we don't say the percent. We say 100. Did you get that? Yes or no? We don't say the percent. We just say a bond sells for 100. Well, that's 100% of face. What if a bond sold for 102? That'd be 102% of face, more than face. What if a bond sold for 99? Come on, talk to me. That's 99% of face. We call that a discount. Now, I'm a little bit ahead of myself, but it all revolves around that terminology. And then the odd one, in my opinion, is sometimes we say in life, a bond sold for par. Well, I think that's a better description for stock. Stock has par. Bonds don't have par. But I think investors sometimes use that lingo, kind of something that applied to stock and apply it to bonds as well because they understand what's going on. If a bond sells for par, it means it sells for exactly face. No premium, no discount. Are you with me on terminology to get started? Yes or no? So let's go back to the promises. I promise if you'll loan me money, I'll pay you back face at maturity. Now, I'm using your money. Are you going to allow me to use your money free? Now, if I had space and allowed you to use my space, I would charge you rent for using that space. Mm -hmm. Do you understand what I just said? Mm -hmm. You rent an apartment or you rent an office building. Rent. 
But we know that the cost of using someone else's money is called interest on your car loan, on your mortgage, on your credit card, on these bonds, we're going to incur interest. I promise if you'll loan me money, I'll pay you back face at maturity. And I promise between now and then, I will pay you interest at the contract rate. It's in writing. It's the one we specified on the bond itself. It's important for us to understand that term because we're going to confuse the issue in just a little bit. This contract rate is specified, agreed upon, in writing. We know it. I promise I'll pay you interest at the contract rate on the face amount. That's the answer to a question you're going to face in the dorm when you're doing homework all by yourself. You've got two interest rates and two amounts that you could think you could calculate it. And if you look back at lecture notes, here is, here's the answer right here. The amount of interest you pay is face times contract. That's what we agreed in writing. I promise I'll pay you face at maturity. And I promise between now and then I'll pay you interest. Those words are descriptive enough, but I thought you might understand it better if we looked at it this way. They are promises that you make now, but come true in the future. If you will loan me money, I, if you will loan me money today, I promise someday I'll pay you back. <coughs> if you will loan me money today, I promise between now and then I will pay you interest, usually in intervals of six months. Every six months we pay some interest. When we pay rent, we pay the rent every month, sometimes. But with interest on a bond, we pay interest in these intervals. And this is a little different from the other liabilities that you're familiar with that I've used today as examples. When you pay a payment on your car, you're paying some interest and some principal. You owe a little less by the time this is over with, you'll owe nothing. When you buy a house, every payment that you make on the house is a payment of interest and a payment of principal. Every time you owe a little bit less, by the, end of, by the time you get to the end of the timeline, you owe nothing. Is that what this picture says? Bonds are different. We're going to get to employ the full amount. You loan me money, I'm going to spend it on my project. And then I'm going to begin accumulating money to try to pay you off at the end. I am not making payments on the principal throughout this process. Do you see that on the screen? If you loan me money, I'll pay you back face at maturity. I just make one payment on the principal five years from now or ten years from now or twenty years from now. But in the meantime, I rent your money, if you want to look at it that way. I'm using your money and I'm only paying you for the cost of using your money. I'm not paying any of the principal. And it helps us in the calculations and the concepts we're trying to portray by making that assumption, by using this as an example. We're going to pay all the principal at the end and we're going to pay interest in the meantime. Now, we've used some of these adjectives already, but I want you to know that there's more than one way to describe what's happening. You've heard us say contract rate. Some people say the stated amount of interest. Sometimes they say the coupon rate of interest. That came about because sometimes we would print the bond, but we would print on the side of the bond, attached to the bond, perforated, negotiable instruments that you would think of as checks. And when that interest became due, we would literally tear that off like a coupon and take it to the bank and the teller at the bank knew what it was. We wouldn't have to wait until the corporation mailed us the check. We could go to the bank and deposit that in our bank account. It was a negotiable thing that they could run through the Federal Reserve System and actually get the money. That's where the, rate, the term coupon rate came about. It's the amount stated on the bond. We call it contract most often. It's called other names. That's all one idea, one thing, called 
called different things, but all mean the same thing. Compared with the market rate of interest, which is determined by the influences in the society, the economic conditions, the inflation rate, the policies of the Federal Reserve System, the general health of the economy, and all sorts of other things affect the price at which a share of stock sells in the marketplace. We never talked about it. We should have a little bit. It wasn't our primary motivation. And now bonds. Once I've raised your awareness level, if you would listen to business reports, TV, radio, look in the newspaper, you might see this discussion and be more aware of it that interest rates are an important part of our economics, economic condition in the country. The price at which a bond sells will be determined by the demands that the investors, the expectations of the, ex the, the investors in the marketplace. Now when these two numbers are the same, no problem. I want to rent your money, how much do you want for it? You want X dollars for it, I'm willing to pay that, we've got a deal. Y'all do understand when I say rent your money, I'm just using that as an expression, don't you? You're gonna let me use your money, I'm gonna pay you for it. But what if the investor wants more than I wrote on my bond? Or the investor is willing to pay less than, willing for me to pay less than that to use the investor's money. Then we've got issues. Then we need to talk about it, and I've got a couple of illustrations to tell you about how that works. Let's pretend that I needed to borrow some money. So I called the printer, and I told the printer to print 8% on my bonds. And yesterday, there were all sorts of ads in the newspaper, and a particular investor who's looking for some place to put his money and to get a yield, he looked at an ad in the paper, and several ads, as a matter of fact, and the going rate seems to be 10%. Now, I had to order my bonds a month ago. It took a long time for the printer to get just the right paper and draw all those squiggly lines on it and get them just so-so. They delivered them day before yesterday and there are boxes of them. And now, oh no, they say 8% and investors are demanding 10%. Do I call the printer and say, okay, could you shred these and print me some more that say 10%? That's gonna be costly. And he says, sure, but it'll cost you. You're going to have to pay for these again. Okay, I understand. What are the chances that in another month from now, when he gets all those printed, the going rate's going to be 10%? Did y'all understand what I just asked? Is it going to be 10%? Am I going to get it right that time? No. It will have wiggled by then. It'll be some other number. Am I ever going to change, to catch that moving target? Unlikely. Don't you agree? So let's try to play the hand we're dealt. I ordered, I've got boxes full of 8% bonds. So let's get them out. Let's get out the white out. Let's just smear that 8% good and juicy with blow it, get a ballpoint pen. Have you ever tried to write on the top of liquid paper? Is this going to be a pleasant experience to change all those 8% to 10%? <laughs> bumpy, 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 yes or no? no. <laughs> uh, and if it were that easy, what would keep somebody else from just getting out the liquid paper on theirs and smearing theirs up with changing theirs to 10% counterfeit? You all with me here or not? That's not going to work. Let's just leave them 8%. And let's try to deal with it, adjust it, talk to me when we have something that our customers don't want to buy in the store, like Christmas decorations right this minute. Y'all want to go over to Walmart and buy Christmas decorations today? Are you going to buy, pay, pay full price for them? No. Walmart wants to get rid of them. They're going to discount them significantly in order for you to take them off their hands. Agree or don't? So I've got an 8% bond and a market rate of 10%. 8% we could describe as contract. 10% is market. 
What do you think about these bonds I'm trying to sell? Are they attractive or unattractive? Say something. Unattractive. They are unattractive. The only way I'm going to be able to get anybody to buy these is to reduce the price. And one of our challenges this week is to determine how low I must reduce the price in order for this bond to become competitive and therefore attractive and for investors to be willing to buy it. The circumstances here are that market is greater than contract. When market is greater than contract, the bonds are unattractive, you told me. That's basic. You need to understand that. If you're too timid today to admit you don't, get help from somebody. Those basic foundations are what we're building the rest of this on. We're going to discount those bonds so that we can sell them in today's market conditions. I hope you're with me. I'm going to give you another chance. I'm going to tell another similar story and see if you can get it the second time through. So I ran an ad in yesterday's paper. And I said, this afternoon at 2.30 in the pit area outside room 5114 in the Graduate Center at 81st and Lewis, we'll be selling 12% bonds. And the investor who opened up yesterday's newspaper saw a whole lot of 10% ads, but ours caught his attention. He can invest in our bonds and make 12%. Did y'all notice the crowd gathering outside when you were on your way to class today? I think I can hear them murmuring outside in the hallway right now. In fact, if I were to run up there and look out that door and just see how many people are gathering in that pit area, I think we've got more people out there than we have bonds for sale. Any good ideas? I hope I heard somebody say, raise the price. Yes or no? I've got bonds that are attractive or unattractive. The contract rate and the market rate of interest have a relationship such that these bonds are desirable. Contract's greater than market this time. We can raise the price. One of the quests we're on this week is how high can we go before we lose this competitiveness that we've established, this attractiveness. These bonds are attractive, and they're going to sell at a premium. We can raise the price. One of our tasks, if you glance back at where the objectives were written, one of the tasks was to determine the sales price of a bond. I'd like for us to do that before we leave the room today. It's in one of your homework problems for next time, for, for late in the week, for second discussion. You need to learn how to determine the sales price of a bond. If you were to see this image on, not, not the image, but what it represents on a playground, what would you call this? Seesaw. Some say teeter-totter, others say seesaw. seesaw. I say seesaw. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? If your major used to be engineering, what did you call this? Your mumblers. A fulcrum? Is that a fulcrum, yes or no? Yes. Take my word for it. <laughs> it's a fulcrum. <laughs> so let's make it a seesaw. No, no, let's make it something that's descriptive of the unique relationship that bonds have that we're trying to convey to you. Let's read it from left to right. When the contract rate of interest and the market rate of interest are exactly the same, when the investor says he, how much he wants to make on this bond and we're paying exactly that much interest, we can strike a deal without any adjustment. When the contract rate of interest and the market rate of interest are exactly the same, the bond will sell for face. Now, I'm hoping you knew that before I showed you that graphic. I want you to think about it one more time. I said it a second ago, but you need to know and understand this. So. Investors want 10%. I'm willing to pay 10%. That was a match. We've got a deal. We don't need to make any calculations. We don't need to raise anything or lower anything. Do you understand what I said? Yes or no? So you're looking for an apartment to rent. They want $400 for the apartment. You think that's a fair deal. You sign the lease. Yes? Uh, that's what I'm talking about. 
When contract and market are the same, we've got an agreement. We're going to sell this for face. But can you anticipate what, what's going to happen when things change a bit? We'll get there. Let's pretend we sold it for that amount. We sold it for face. We're going to debit cash for the amount we received from the investors. They gave us money. We're borrowing money. And we're promising we'll pay it back. I promise I will pay you back face at maturity. It's a credit to bonds payable, a brand new account. It's a liability. It's a long-term liability. It's normal balance is credit. Now today I've talked about investors' point of view and the corporation's point of view. But really our whole perspective is borrower's point of view. We need money. We're borrowing it from the public. Lots of individual people bought bonds. The total amount was a big amount. A million dollars, two million dollars, three million dollars. It's a lot of money that we're borrowing to accomplish this project that we have in mind. Let's change the circumstances. Read from left to right with me. When contract is greater than market, whoa. <laughs> Is our bond attractive or unattractive? Attractive. Say something. Attractive. Our interest rate is higher than they can get any place else. Then we can raise the price. The bond will sell for more than face. We've said that in another venue. It's just my attempt to get you to see it better here. When we sell a bond for more than face, we're going to get money and we're going to promise to pay it back. But the money we got was greater than the amount we're going to pay back. I'm going to make up numbers. So we borrowed a million and received 1.1 million. Are y'all with me or not? Yes? Debits and credits don't equal, and we're going to get them to equal by crediting premium on bonds payable for 100000 Premium on bonds payable reminds me a little of freight in first semester. Freight in was a sub purchases account. Purchases balance was debit. Freight in's balance was debit. We had already established an, a word for things that were the opposite, contra, but we had nothing to describe something that was the same where the two accounts were added together. Bonds payable is a long term liability. Premium has a credit balance like bonds payable does. If I'm going to prepare a balance sheet today, I'm going to add premium to bonds payable. Premium must be sub bonds payable. Did you hear it? Did you follow that? Yes or no? Yeah. That's something we've done before. Showing it on the balance sheet is our ultimate goal. But let's talk about this balance of premium. They gave me 100000 Do I have to pay it back? Yes or no? Mm -hmm. You're supposed to know. Yeah. I've said it in a different way earlier today in this room. Tell me, do I have to pay back the 100000 No. no. Yes. I promise I will pay you back face. We established that at the beginning when we were talking in as simple a terms as possible. Do you remember that? Yes or no? Yeah. I promise I'll pay you back the million. I have no obligation to pay you this then what happens to that? Well, we're going to spend the million on a project and try to make money. We need to make money to pay all of our costs, including interest, and we've got to pay this back someday. We need to make enough money to accumulate that money and be able to pay it off at the end. Yes? What about the 100000 Well, we'll spend it too, just like we did this. But what we're going to do with the 100000 is pretend. That 100000 extra that they gave us that we don't have to pay back will reduce our interest cost and reduce the investor's yield in the marketplace. They're not making quite as much on this as they thought they were. And that happened when we made a deal and decided to exchange that amount of money at the beginning of this. When they gave us the money, 
loaned us the 1.1 million. We locked into that market rate of interest as being the effective rate of interest for this bond. And that's one of the calculations we've got to learn to make this week. Here's another one. Let's read from left to right. When the contract rate of interest is less than the market rate, is this bond attractive or unattractive? unattractive. It's unattractive. Then we must reduce the price in order to be able to sell it in the marketplace. We're going to sell it for less than face. And the journal entry that comes from that debits cash for the amount we receive in cash. That's been the same in all three of these entries. Credits, bonds payable for the amount I have to pay back face. These numbers at the moment don't agree. I would make this balance by debiting an account called discount on bonds payable. It's contra bonds payable. If we prepared a balance sheet today, we would list bonds payable and subtract the discount. The difference in those two numbers is called the bond carrying amount. The bond carrying amount would be less than face at the moment, but we would want the bond carrying amount to be face by the time we get to maturity. In both the case of the premium and the discount, we would like in some way or fashion to systematically get rid of premium or discount. And that's the second major thing we're going to do in this chapter. The first being determine the sales price of the bond. The second being amortization. And that is getting rid of this premium or discount account. Let's talk about selling this bond at a discount. I'm going to make up new numbers. Let's say we borrowed $4 million, face, and they gave us $3.8 million. The $200,000 that we didn't get, what about that $200,000? Do we have to pay it back? No. Yes or no? Yeah. You are concerning me a little bit. I told you these answers at the beginning of today for such a time as this, and I think you're getting to those answers that you're giving me some other way than I promise if you will loan me money, I will pay you back face. face. This is four million. This is three point eight million. This is two hundred thousand. Are you with me on the math? Yes. Do I have to pay back the two hundred thousand that I didn't get? Yes. I promise I will pay you back four million face. Yes, I have to pay back that 200000 that I didn't get. Yes, I have to pay it back. Ooh. So I'm going to pay you interest every six months. And at the end, I have to pay you back $4 million, 200000 more than you gave me. That's increasing my interest cost and increasing the investor's yield. I'm only looking at this from the corporation's point of view. That is additional interest expense I'm incurring throughout the life of this bond. And we will allocate that through amortization. And that's one of the major lessons this week. Here's a real ad I tore out of the paper years ago. It's old, but it's still relevant, where a company was borrowing a hundred million dollars. I told you we were going to talk about a lot of money. And it says that the interest rate is ten and three eighths percent. That's contract. It also says that the price is ninety nine point eight two percent. A hundred would be face. Sometimes we say a hundred percent, sometimes we live off the percent signs. A hundred would be face. 101 would be a premium. 98 would be a discount. Are y'all with me or not? Mm -hmm. Yes or no? Mm -hmm. What is 99.8, a premium or a discount? Mm -hmm. Knowing that, what can you tell me about the market rate of interest? If contract is 10.38, and we're selling this at a discount. We don't know the exact number. We can't calculate the exact number, but we can get a ball, ballpark relationship. Is this bond attractive or unattractive? unattractive? It's unattractive if we had to discount it. The going rate in the marketplace must be greater than 
or less than 10 and 3 eighths. It has to be slightly greater than 10 and 3 eighths percent. We don't know the number for sure, but it had to be sold at a discount. It had to be unattractive. The market had to be greater than that contract. That's real life stuff we're talking about. So, I think someplace in your educational experience before you came to college, you were supposed to learn about interest, about the compounding of interest, about how if you put some money in a savings account and leave it there to work, you'll get more interest added to your account. And the next time they calculate the interest, they'll calculate it on what you put there and what it's earned. And the next time they calculate it, they'll put what you put there plus what you've earned in interest to determine the new interest. Are you familiar with this technique? Say yes or no. Yes. Yes. This is called compounding interest. I hope that if I gave you a problem and asked you to calculate a balance like this someplace down the line, that you could start there and work this direction and determine the amount of interest that had been earned. I hope that's a skill that you have and know about because I want to take that concept and teach you something from it. The biggest lesson of all in this chapter is called the time value of money. It's based on the premise that money will work for you if you put it to work, if you employ it. And this concept is perhaps the most important that we teach in business and is probably taught in more business classes than any other one concept. This is intended to be the introduction. If you've seen it someplace else, good. You bring some experience into this, good. But if you don't, it would be great for you to master the idea here so that you could apply it other places, in other courses, on the job, and in your personal life. The present value concept is an important one. So what if you said, I wanted to have $5,000 in a savings account here? What would you have to put in a savings account here in order for it to grow to be that? This is an action you could control. That is something that's going to happen in the future. This idea is called present value because we want to take a future amount and bring it back to today. That idea of time value of money and determining the present value of money is going to be the way that we accomplish determining the sales price of the bond. We want to know the price at which a bond should sell, particularly when contract and market are not the same. When contract and market are not the same, we can determine the sales price of the bond by taking a future promise. Have you seen this image today already? Yes. Well, what I want to do, I want to show you how to do, is to take that future promise. I promise I will pay you back someday and bring that amount back to today. That would be the present value of the principal. I am going to pay you interest in six months and a year and a year and a half and two years. I would like to bring this number back to today. That would be its present value. I would like to bring this number back to today and this number back to today and so forth. Bring each of those numbers. A bond will sell for the present value of face plus the present value of the interest. A bond will sell for the present value of face plus the present value of the interest. We'll compare that number and sell it for that number and make the journal entry for that number. A bond will sell for the present value of face plus the present value of the interest. Now our big task is to find the numbers to support that to be able to get those numbers to learn how to calculate present value. Here's an exercise we can use for this purpose and several others. Our company issued $260,000 of 9% tenure bonds on January 1st for $243,799. This price resulted in an effective interest rate of 10% on the bonds. You need to decide which one of those numbers is contract 
And which one of those numbers is market? Have you decided? Mm -hmm. You need to look at the comparison between them and decide whether this is favorable or unfavorable. Say something. This bond is unfavorable because it's paying 9% and investors are demanding 10%. Is this bond attractive or unattractive? unattractive? It's unattractive. This bond is going to sell for a discount. The question is, how low must we reduce the price in order for this bond to be competitive and be desirable in the marketplace? Read on. Interest is payable semi-annually on July 1st and January 1st. We use the effective interest method to amortize bond premium or discount because it's better. Interest is not accrued on June 30th. Prepare the journal entries to record the issuance of the bonds. Before we can do that, we need to determine the sales price of the bond. Before we can do that, we need to get the amount of one, one interest payment. You're supposed to know the formula. Principal times rate times time will determine interest. The principal of this bond was $260,000. The interest rate, uh-oh, we got two choices. 9% or 10%? I'm trying to determine the amount of each interest payment. Is it going to be contract or market? 9% or 10%? Say something. I addressed this at the beginning of today. You're going to be in your dorm room working homework and wondering, oh, here's two interest rates, which should I use? And it was at the very beginning of the class today. I promise I'll pay you back at maturity. I promise between now and then I'll pay you interest at the, on the face amount, at the contractor market, contract rate, which was contract in this exercise, 9% or 10%? 9%. It's 9%. 260,000 times 9% expressed semi-annually. You can divide by 2, you can multiply by 0.5, you can half the interest rate. I choose to illustrate it by saying six twelfths because to me that sounds like a year. I think when you look at cold notes, you're going to wonder why you divided by two or wonder why you multiplied by half. When you look at cold notes and say six twelfths, it just sounds more like a portion of a year. The amount of each and every interest payment in this problem is $11,700. Now, I need that in a few minutes. I'm going to be doing something else in a few minutes. I didn't want to be interrupted and come back to that. I wanted to establish that we will come back to it in a minute. I want to know the present value of the $260,000, and we're going to do that. We're going to find that by looking at the present value tables in the back of your book. If you've got a book with you today, get it out real quickly. There's a short table in the chapter. There's a longer, more deliberate table at the back of the book. If you brought one with you and somebody can share with you, that'd be great. It's in Appendix D in the back of the book, and the present value tables are on D4. Actually, there are two tables we're going to look at, the first of which is Table 1. This is what the whole thing looks like. We need to know what to look up in the table. We need to know how it works. Now, we know what interest to pay. We're going to pay contract. Contract was 9%. The question we're trying to answer is, what will this bond sell for under today's market conditions? So the rule is, you always look up market. We're looking up 10%. And we're doing it semi-annually. So look up here a second. If it's 10% for a year, that seems to be 5% for the first six months and 5% for the last six months. Does that seem reasonable? Yes or no? Yeah. So I could provide for compounding of interest. So let me say it differently. I could get close if I looked up 10%. 10% for 10 years would be close. I don't want to get close. That sounds like an estimate. If I can get it right on the nose, I want to get it right on the nose. So to provide for compounding, I'm going to half the interest rate. Half the interest rate would be 5%. 5% for the first half of the year, 5% for the second half of the year. is still 10% for the year, but it's the compounding of interest. So I'm going to look in the 5% column, 
And instead of looking on row 10, it was a 10 year period, row 10 would be if it was annual interest, 10%. When I halved it, 5%, 5%, I doubled the payment periods. Now instead of there being 10 payment periods, there are 20. I'm going to look in the 5% column on row 20 and find the factor to be 0.37689. Are you with me, yes or no? Yes. 0.37689 times the principal, <coughs> times face. Three point three seven, 0.37689 times the face, 260,000, is the present value. 97,000, 98,000 roughly, you see the right number there, is the present value. To use the same example I used today, if I put $98,000 in a savings account today and left it there to just grow, made no withdrawals from that, I let it grow, that would be $260,000 in 10 years. Do you understand what we just did? Say yes or no. Yes. The present value of 260000 in the future is $98,000. I brought that future amount back to today. Now, we want to do the same thing with the interest. We want to bring, down, bring back each and every interest payment. If we use that same table that we just did, we would have to make 20 calculations. We would have to multiply it by 20 factors in that table. Whew. You talk about running down the batteries on your calculator. That's a lot of number crunching. There is another tool that we can use. It's in the back of your book in Appendix D. It's two pages over from the page we were looking upon. This table, the one we looked at, was called present value of one. Present value of a dollar. But the other table is present value of an annuity. <coughs> an annuity is something that happens over and over again. And that's exactly what we have with 11,700, 11,700, 11,700, 11,700 being paid every six months. We can bring all those future amounts back to today in one fail swoop. You always look up market in the table. In this calculation, you always look in the same column on the same row that you did before. It's 10%. 10% for 10 years would get us close. I'm not content to be close. I want to get it right on the nose. I want to allow for compounding. I'm going to half the interest rate. I'm going to look in the 5% column. And when I half the interest rate, I'm going to double the payment periods. In the 5% column on row 20, the factor is 12.46221. Are you with me or not? Yes. We can take one interest payment, 11,700. Multiply it by that factor, 12.46221, and get the amount of interest, the present value of the interest. The present value of the interest is $145,807. If you received some, a, a trust fund was established for you. If they put $145,807 in the trust fund, every six months you could withdraw $11,700. You could make 20 withdrawals from that fund. A bond will sell for the present value of the face plus the present value of the interest that number in this case is $243,799. Where have I seen that number before? Shall we read the exercise one more time? We sold bonds for second line, $243,799. It was there all the time. We just took 10 minutes to find a number that we were given. Are we going to be given that number in real life? No. We used that number as a check figure. And we, were, we know now how they got it. In one of your homework problems for next week, for this week, late in the week, it says in the syllabus, you must present the determination of the selling price of the bond. The format that you just saw on the previous slide would be an acceptable way to do that. 
a separate sheet of paper or someplace in a D2L Excel document, you've got to explain how you use this present value factors to bring that number back to today. Today we've talked about making a journal entry. From this information, let's make the journal entry real quick. We would debit cash for the amount we just received. We would credit bonds payable with face. We got less than face. We make this entry balance by debiting discount $16,201. You know, I have never been able to finish this handout in class. I've always wanted to finish it, but it would take me first discussion to finish the rest of it. And now I'm not going to do this in first discussion. I'm going to ask you to see the video so that we can do something else in class. It's going to help you to give you another exposure more than any other video I've put up there. I would like you to see this one. It picks up about where we left off. Actually, it goes back a little bit, recaps what we just did. Maybe you needed to hear it again. And then finishes this handout. It would be good for you to do it before you do your second two homework problems, but you would understand what goes on in first discussion better if you would do it before you come to first discussion. I hope you'll see it sometime this week for your sake. I think it'll do you good. Have a nice day.